Suspicious activity in the Susquehannock. Dear Scary Stories NYC. I was in the Susquehannock State Forest in autumn, hiking alone and trying to get out of my depressed funk. Unlike many depressed people, I was not experiencing being dumped by someone recently. In fact, I asked her to stay home so I could hike alone and try to get her nasty, toxic, and value-free voice out of my head. I needed some alone time to be certain. I had stepped on my cell phone to break it on day two because I needed her to stop texting me. Unfortunately, that was also my compass and my GPS, so I'm not 100% certain where I was when all this insane stuff went down. I know it was nighttime and it was one of the hectic nights. One of the strange nights, you know? If you've hiked in PA, then you probably know what I mean. One of the nights when things feel... different. Sometimes those are the best nights. Other times those are the scariest. Actually, the hectic nights can be the worst and the best at the same time. This was one of those nights. I was walking alone in the dark, and I heard the voices coming from somewhere nearby. There was a man, and he was talking to other people, who occasionally responded to him. I couldn't understand what anyone was saying, though, which made me even more curious. When I figured out which direction it was originating from... I walked uphill into the woods, looking to find out what was going on. I walked up behind a big muscular man who was speaking to some younger people, some younger men, seated on the grass in front of him. I ducked down behind a bush so that they wouldn't see me, and I listened. He was speaking Spanish to them. I took Spanish for three years in school, so of course I don't know much Spanish at all. I could pick out words and phrases here and there, but I was having trouble pulling them together into something that had meaning. And then I heard the word Diablo, which I knew meant devil from, I don't know, maybe an old Clint Eastwood movie or something. So I figured this was some kind of a horror movie club, gathered in the woods to talk about cool movies and whatnot. I started sneaking around the side, trying to get behind the small crowd, and watch the speaker give his speech better. That guy looked like an American, but he spoke Spanish fluently. But he was as muscular as any hero from a Mexican wrestling horror movie. I even wondered if he was a wrestler, and if that's why these people were gathered to hear him speak. As I passed to the side of the young men gathered to listen on the grass, I found them impossible to see any longer. I could still see the grass they had been sitting on, but they themselves had disappeared from my view. I wasn't understanding this optical illusion, so I walked back up a bit in the direction of the speechifying wrestler, and then I could see the crowd again. They were all staring in rapt attention at the speechmaker, and it was as though they were all lit up by his attention itself, bathing in the light of this shaman's intentions. That was when I stopped thinking of him as a Mexican wrestling horror movie star and began wondering if this were a true shaman that I was watching before me. As I settled into a comfortable hidden position to watch, this man lifted his massive muscular arms, and then as I continued to watch, he began to change. There was energy flying off of him in such a way that I had to shield my eyes and cover my ears. It was horrible to take, but when the radiation died down again, I looked up to see a monster in place of that man. And now I stayed locked in place, truly frightened to move and be discovered. Now I regretted leaving the path. Now I even regretted leaving that hurtful woman who perversely enjoyed abusing me. I was going to have to risk watching this entire ritual or lesson or whatever this was. It seemed that the students or audience were just as surprised by what happened as I was, as there were assorted oohs and ahs and surprise sounds going on over there in that crowd that I could hear but only occasionally see. The man continued to speak in Spanish, but more labored over time, with words becoming slurred by his continuing transformations, one after the next. 
He continued to progress toward being something that I guess I would call a werewolf. He appeared to be more canine over time, but he continued to stand on two legs for the entire event. Now that's a werewolf, right? Because that's what I was seeing. He was trying to explain things about his transformations to the assembled, but I wasn't understanding too much of what he was saying. It seemed to be a how-to class for the most part, but there was a section of the speech in which I wondered if he was actually teaching the class or audience about werewolves for some other reason besides they themselves becoming werewolves. But there was a section of the speech in which I wondered if he was actually teaching the class or audience about werewolves for some other reason besides they themselves becoming werewolves. For instance, I thought he might be instructing them on the various kinds of werewolves that exist in the world. Maybe this was some sort of VR world classroom. Maybe that was why I could only see the class from my angles where they were hit by the light from the teacher's area. Like, what if this was some kind of futuristic video meetup? When it started to feel more science fiction than supernatural horror, I found myself lightening up and feeling a little better than before. I decided to sneak on out of there, but literally the second I stood to leave, the big werewolf turned and looked right at me. Well, at least the teacher was real, and he began shouting Transformar, Transformar to the crowd. I could hear those men changing into werewolves, but I could not see them from my angle. I ran away, and I could hear them all pursuing me. It didn't bother looking back. It didn't matter if I could see them or not. I knew they were all still there. Onward I ran, not knowing where I was going, unsure what direction my pursuers were even located in. It was a night of pure horror for me. I was a paranoid wreck by the morning, when I found my way back to my car and drove home exhausted. Since that time I have gone through a number of stages. For a while, I thought that all dogmen were really one of these shape-shifting Spanish brujo magician people, whatever you want to call them. Skinwalkers, wizards, they go by many names. Especially if you go from culture to culture. Now I think the skinwalkers are actually imitating something. That there is a true source that they are impersonating and embodying. I do think there may be something that we would call a dogman. It's just that I think the dogman comes from the other world, the other side. So when we see dog-headed men, we might be looking at shamans or we might be looking at a creature that wandered into our world through a portal of some kind, either a natural one or one opened by one of these shamanic skinwalkers that I got chased by that night. Those men were not practicing superstitions. I saw the man change. There has to be real hard science behind it somehow. Those men are just practicing a science that predates science, that's all. And that's what I think I've learned. We've got an extra long special tonight with over an hour of dogman and werewolf stories for Halloween. We finish this episode with a PQ story picked out just for you. And the first good luck scary dogman story is this all new never before heard true story that we've been told happened in the Midwest in 1977. And so we're calling this one The Werewolf of 1977. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I saw a real werewolf one time but I almost never found out that that was what it was. You see, it followed us on Halloween, and people just thought they were seeing the most magnificent Wolfman costume of all time. Let me tell you the story, and how we found out it was real before we got ourselves hurt. I'm 65 this year, or I turned 65 during Thanksgiving week in November. So that means I was 19 when this happened to me in 1977. At the time, I was sharing a house just off my college campus in Michigan, and I fully considered myself an adult by that point. The drinking age back then was 18 in New York, where I was from. So back there, at least, I was legally a grown-up. Nevertheless, 
when my housemates asked me to throw together a costume and go trick-or-treating with them, I jumped at the chance. We set out on our adventure as dark settled over the neighborhood, and the first wave of younger trick-or-treaters were retiring for the evening. Some people were out of candy already and tossed us cans of beer instead, and we soon found ourselves having a grand old time. We went from door to door, laughing and carousing, and fortunately nobody denied us some kind of treat. That meant we didn't have to pull any tricks on anybody in return. But fate was to play a trick on the bunch of us. So we went from house to house, getting increasingly blitzed and partied out as we went along on our merry way. And we never noticed that somewhere along the path, our party had increased in number by one. When one of the people handing out treats from their front door complimented us on the werewolf costume, we all looked around in confusion. None of us had gone as a werewolf. We couldn't afford anything so fancy. And besides, we had thrown our costumes together out of what was at hand. What werewolf was this woman talking about? When one of my housemates screamed, I looked where her eyes were pointing, and I saw a werewolf all right. Except it wasn't a werewolf costume. That was some kind of a real animal. And I shouted that out. Someone else shouted back, asking what kind of a real animal looks like a werewolf. And that was when we all shut up and locked eyes with each other. A werewolf is what looks like a werewolf. Which meant that Wow, we all burst out in different directions at once, leaving that lady standing there with her door open and a dog man standing four or five feet in front of her. Hopefully she was all right. I was too busy running away like a chicken to find out, though. I don't know where the others went, but I found myself running through the woods to get home, and I didn't even know we had woods in our neighborhood. I think it was an overgrown lot or something, but... Man, it was dark and spooky in there. I was completely sobered up by the time I figured out how to get home. And the others were all up drinking coffee and talking a mile a minute about what we had all just lived through. One of the girls stayed by the front window, convinced that the dog man was going to come down the sidewalk looking for us. We all made fun of her, thinking that the creature could have followed us home, when suddenly there came a thump on the back porch. And then another. We all ran up the staircase to where there was this window that looked out on the back porch from the second story. And we saw the dogman werewolf thing out there, pushing on our back door, which was a pull door. He didn't seem to understand why it wasn't opening for him. I was the only one who had come home through the back door. So everyone blamed me for leading the werewolf back to our house. I called the cops who came out, saw nothing, and lectured us all that we were troublemaking kids. Almost as soon as the cops left, the dog man came back and pushed on our back door a few more times before getting frustrated and wandering off into the woods. As far as I know, he never came back. So that tells us something about the dog man. The dog man doesn't like being bored. So if he's trying to get into your house, just basically lock your doors and he'll probably get distracted by a butterfly or something and go away. Because although the dog man may be one of the fiercest, most brutal, and vicious living things on planet Earth, the dog man is not a deep intellectual. So we just presented him with a bit of a small puzzle had to get through a locked door and the dog man was overwhelmed then retreated and that was the simple way that we accidentally defeated the werewolf of 1977 hey it's me pq river and i'll be coming back to scary stories to read an all new scary dog man tale on october 30th it's going to be creepy, and it should get you in the Halloween spirit, so don't miss it. All new. 
werewolf encounter stories beginning with story number one my fate in the claws of the dogman dear scary stories nyc i have a dogman encounter story for you that happened to me when i was still young and beautiful just last week i'm kidding this story took place over 30 years ago now i'm sorry to say to me it still feels like fresh news I still get goosebumps when I tell this story. I had been out on a date with this guy who was handsome and had rich parents, but who was not a very nice person. When I didn't put out on the first date, he actually kicked me out of his car alongside the highway in the middle of the night. I didn't even know where I was. And this was, I guess, a few years before I got a cell phone. I don't actually even remember when I got my first cell, but this was the early 90s, and I know the iPhone came out like, four or five years after 9-11. So I don't think I had even a primitive flip phone on me, and I was stranded wearing high heels and an expensive fancy party dress because I had been stupidly excited to be dating this particular guy. It was one of those hard life lessons that almost got me killed. I realized how vulnerable I was in that situation, and I really didn't even have the vaguest idea what to do. I just started walking in the direction the creep had been driving, Figuring that must be the way home. I began to wonder if this road ever had any traffic at all wherever I was. It sure was dark. If a car did come along, would I ask it for a ride? I didn't know. It seemed like I'd be walking into an even worse situation if I did that. Maybe I could ask the driver to call the cops to come get me. But my mother had told me stories about some highway patrol officers she had known, who were uh, unethical. And I wasn't sure that would result in me being any safer anyhow. That was the most scared I had ever been. But trust me, the night was still young. My feet and ankles were hurting almost immediately and I had a hard time keeping myself from crying, but I had decided I was going to be brave. I prayed silently that someone would help me, that maybe someone could be sent to protect me. I was desperate, obviously. When I heard someone walking behind me, I was so delirious that I actually turned around, hoping it was an angel. It was not an angel. It was a dog man, or else some kind of big werewolf sort of guy. I remember looking at him from his big dog feet, up his super muscular body covered in short fur, up to his monster jaws and his dinosaur teeth, and his glowing alien eyes. When our eyes met, he growled this deep growl that tickled the undersides of my feet, had made my heels wobble. I remember I turned around to face forward again before I started screaming bloody murder. I sort of hopped in the air and I tried to run away as best as I could without falling, but I was not making much progress. By this point I was bawling my eyes out and focusing all my attention on where I was stepping. I refused to look behind me and I just wanted to keep moving forward. I didn't know when that huge dog man was going to take me from behind and end everything for me. But I wanted to go down at least trying to get away. I wanted my father to see that I had tried to escape. I wanted him to be proud of me that I did not give up. But I could hardly see where I was going through my tears. Even though I was facing forward, in my mind all I could see was the teeth of the monster walking behind me. I could smell his body odor. I could smell his breath. I could see his eyes glowing as though someone had inserted Christmas lights in his skull. In fact, I can see and smell those things even now as I type this out for you. That's just how intensely scared that creature beast made me at the time. I could hear the dog man walking behind me. I could feel the heavy impact each of his footsteps made on the road and I shivered all over each time he landed down again. It all seemed very real to me, but honestly now looking back on it, I had begun to cry pretty intensely, 
And I don't know how much of what I was hearing might have been either me hearing myself crying, or even me imagining sounds because I was so frightened. Each second I waited to hear that monster roar and grab me. Every single moment had me too scared to look behind, wondering when my entire life was going to end in screaming agony. I heard one loud whoop from a police siren, so close to me that it hurt. I screamed so hard that I actually hurt my throat and created a situation that took months to heal. My feet slid out from under me and I landed on my butt, somehow managing to give myself a neck ache in the process. These two nice cops helped me up and asked me what the heck I was doing walking along the highway alone in the middle of the night, crying. The dogman was gone. It was clear they had never seen it. It might have left as soon as I started walking away from it. I don't really know because I was too scared to ever look back there. The two cops did their job professionally and brought me home, then even caught my parents after I fell into their arms weeping hysterically. You know, even my mother, who dislikes police, admitted they made the situation less horrible than it might have been, and they did rescue her daughter from danger. My parents both think I imagined the dogman entirely. I don't think I did. But I was still hearing it walk behind me right up until the police siren whooped. It could not have been that close to me when the cops pulled up, or they would have seen it. So I know I was imagining it still being behind me at the end. Does that mean I imagined the entire thing, though? I don't personally think so. It's one thing to imagine hearing footsteps behind you. It's another thing entirely to imagine seeing and hearing and smelling something so specific as a bear-sized dog-headed monster man. Like, why that image? Why not aliens? Why not the Frankenstein monster? I don't know, I can understand how my state of panic caused me to think the monster was still behind me. But for the state of panic itself to create an entire very specific monster? I just don't know. I just don't know, that doesn't feel right to me in my belly, you know? It doesn't sound like the correct interpretation. My opinion is that either the creature was only curious about me and it wandered off by itself when it got bored. Or maybe it did have bad intentions for me but it ran off when it heard the cops approaching. In either case, this is my one and only cryptid sighting so far, and I hope it is also my last ever. Story number two. Dogman made me pee my pants. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I am a guy who used to love camping more than anything else but I'm having trouble getting up the nerve to go back into the woods. I think I might be suffering from a bit of emotional trauma from a sighting that my brother and I had of the dogman. In fact, it was more than a sighting. It was practically a sneak attack. My brother, who I shall call Dirk the Daring, and I were out in the woods of the Allegheny National Forest, north of De Young, which is in the northwestern corner of Pennsylvania. We were camping off trail. We didn't have a campfire that night because we were too close to the trees. And also because we weren't sure we were legally allowed to camp where we were. So we didn't want the smoke from a campfire giving us away. We had been hiking all day and really hadn't planned out too well where we were going to camp that night. So we had to pitch one of our tents in a very, very small clearing in an extremely dense part of the woods in August. Honestly, it almost felt like we were in a closet. The trees were so thick around us, in an almost square-shaped clearing of hard, rocky dirt. There was absolutely no breeze in there, and it was a hot August night. As darkness fell, I was glad that we had a tent to sleep in, as the woods were somewhat oppressively dense all around us. It made me feel both unsafe, as well as a bit claustrophobic, even when I was outside. The crickets and whatever other night animals or insects were kind of intimidatingly loud, and it was not a comfortable place to be. Still, it was so hot that we were sitting up on the rocky ground just outside the tent just to get a breeze for as long as we could until we were tired enough to go into our sleeping bags and get some sleep. There was just no comfortable place to be that night. 
My brother Dirk the Daring and I are both cowards. We didn't realize it till that night, but it's true. We are both chickens. Neither of us wanted to leave the front of the tent for any reason. And so it was only a matter of time till we both needed to go on a walk into the woods so that we could relieve ourselves. But we held it in, because we were too scared to walk into those woods in the dark. Now don't get me wrong, this was not our first time camping, but this was our first time feeling scared about it. Something was different about that place on that night, and we knew deep down that something was bad. Eventually we couldn't hold it in anymore and we both decided that we'd go for a walk into the woods together in order to relieve ourselves. If there were two of us, we'd be safer than if we were alone, so together we went into the dark forest, as scared as if we were still kids. Once we were walking under the tree cover, it was even darker and was also very quiet. That felt strange to me, how loud our footsteps seemed since there was no other sound to drown it all out. Where were the crickets? I hadn't noticed them stopping their chirping, but they definitely had, since I couldn't hear them anymore. I started paying attention and I heard my footsteps. I also heard my brother's footsteps. And I heard something else. But I wasn't sure what that other sound was. Was someone else nearby? I stopped walking and I motioned for Dirk to stop as well, so that I could listen more intently. From behind us came one grunt, and we both screamed and wet ourselves. I'm not sure which of us had the higher pitched scream, since we both embarrassed ourselves and sounded like small children squealing. But Dirk definitely wet himself even more extensively than I had. I still kid him about that to this day. I mean, I wet myself when that dogman showed up, I admit it. But Dirk drenched himself. Well, you know, we had gone into the woods to take a pee, so there was no further reason for us to be there anymore. We ran. I know you're not supposed to run from a predator of any kind, but this was a creature that looked like a big furry muscle man with a monster head on top, okay? I ran faster than I'd ever run in the dark before. And man, was my crotch cold in the breeze. Dirk ran into a branch and hit his head pretty hard. But we both kept circling back to camp, where we got inside the tent and zipped it up. Back in the tent, we could hear the crickets again, so maybe the dogman was already gone. But we couldn't be sure. We both sat up there, too scared to even change our pants until the dawn came up. And then, no matter how tired we were... We hiked that next morning until we found ourselves an official place to camp. We cut our trip short because even staying with a bunch of other campers felt unnerving after our encounter with the Pennsylvania Dogman. Story number three. Werewolf at the bus stop. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I was standing at the bus stop waiting for the party bus to arrive. It was getting pretty late, and the only sound was the chirping of crickets in the woods behind me. I was starting to get a little scared. Suddenly I smelled smoke. I turned around and I saw a fire growing in the woods. I started to panic. What if the fire spread to the bus stop? What if I got stranded here all alone? Then I noticed movement in the forest. When I looked, I saw something that made my blood run cold. It was a huge, bear-sized, canine creature. It was standing upright like a human, and it had glowing red eyes and long, sharp fangs. The creature growled at me. I froze in terror. I thought this was it. I was gonna die. But then I heard another noise. It was the sound of a bus horn. The party bus was here. The bus driver saw the creature and slammed on his brakes. The bus screeched to a halt right in front of me. I ran as fast as I could toward that bus while the door wasn't even open yet. As soon as it opened, I jumped into the bus 
The driver closed the door behind me and I collapsed into a seat, relieved and hoping I was safe. When I looked out the front window, I saw the creature standing in the middle of the road. It was staring at the bus, its red eyes glowing in the darkness. The bus driver told us to hold on, gave a honk of his horn, and hit the gas. We all sped toward the creature and we were screaming. At the very last second, it stepped aside. The bus pulled away and we watched out the side and back windows as the creature disappeared into the distance. I didn't sleep much that night. I kept thinking about the creature and wondering what it was. I had never seen anything like it before, but I was also grateful to be alive. I knew that if the bus driver hadn't arrived when he did, I'd probably be dead. The next day I told my friends about what had happened. They didn't believe me at first, but some of my other friends were also witnesses. Soon they were all convinced. We all agreed that there had never been anything like this in our area before. We decided to do some research on the creature. We found your channel on YouTube and learned about the Dogman, which I guess is what you guys call these kinds of creatures. We've since learned that dogmen are large canine animals that walk upright like humans. They're said to be very aggressive and dangerous. And after some research, we found that the dogman is common to our area, even though we had never heard of it before. It was creepy to know that these creatures are out there all around us, and they could be anywhere. I'm still not sure what to think about the animal I saw that night. Was it really a dogman? What else could it have been? I don't know. But I know one thing. I'll never wait for a bus alone at night again. And our final story, story number four. Hallucinatory Campfire Dogman. Dear Scary Stories. I've been sitting at my campfire for hours, staring at the mesmerizing dance of the flames. I feel strange. I feel off somehow. I'm not sure how or why. Maybe I'm exhausted from hiking. Or maybe it's the hunger gnawing at my stomach. Or maybe it's something else. I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. I stand up and I walk to the edge of the clearing. The forest is silent, save for the occasional rustle of leaves or the snap of a twig. I strain my eyes in the darkness, but I can't see anything out there. I take a deep breath and I step into the woods. I don't know why I'm doing it. I should be heading back to my tent, but I can't resist the urge to go deeper into the forest. I walk for what feels like minutes, then feels like hours. My mind is foggy. My legs are heavy. I'm starting to feel lost in more ways than one. Suddenly I see something moving in the distance. It's a large, dark shape. I freeze. My heart is pounding in my chest. The shape gets closer. I can see that it's a creature. It's huge. Bear-sized. With the head of a dog. Its eyes are glowing golden. So bright that they hurt to look directly into. I try to run. But my legs won't move. I'm paralyzed with fear. The creature is standing in front of me now. It's so close that I can smell its bad breath. I open my mouth to scream, but no sound comes out. The creature leans in close and stares into my eyes with its golden orbs. I feel myself slipping away. The next thing I know, I'm lying on the cold forest floor. The sun is rising on the horizon. I sit up and look around. I'm back at my campsite. The campfire is dead. I stand up and brush myself off. My head is pounding. My body is aching. I try to remember what happened, but my mind is blank. All I can remember is the creature. Its golden glowing eyes. It's bad breath. I shake my head, trying to clear it. Maybe I was dreaming? But then I see something on the ground. It's a single golden hair. 
I pick it up and examine it closely. It's long, and it's really thick for a hair, with a strange metallic sheen. I'm not sure what to make of it. Was I really visited by a monster last night? Or was it all just a bad dream? I don't know. But I do know that I'm never going camping alone again. Whether you doubt us or if you believe us are executive producers in Asensio de Divas, please join me in thanking Inocencio de Divas for making this episode possible. Inocencio is a member of our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com, which means he gets to see all our secret uncensored stories, of which we usually do four a month, but I think we're doing six or seven this month because it's October and we're excited for Halloween. Since Inocencio is a top tier member, he also gets free advanced previews and special secret videos that the public never gets to see. We also have channel memberships right here on YouTube if you don't want to use PayPal. How I Quit Being a Werewolf Dear Scary Stories NYC, I am a former werewolf, or possibly a recovering one. I haven't had a relapse so far, and I am hoping that the situation is entirely in my past. I'm going to tell you how I got to this point. But my solution probably wouldn't work for everybody. For that reason, I'm also going to include some of my recent research at the end, where I've been looking into other alleged cures for the condition. I think there's a whole list of reasons people end up becoming werewolves, and so each cure is going to have to be a completely personal and unique kind of a journey. I'm going to jump right in and tell you my story, and hopefully it'll all make sense to you as I move through it. I grew up the only child of a business owner and a housewife. I've had no complaints about my upbringing. In fact, I miss my parents terribly. They were taken from this world in a traffic accident and I inherited enough money that I could afford to buy things that numbed my shock and pain and loss. Before that money came through, my girlfriend also passed and she was a victim of terrible violence. I'm not even going to begin to describe that. Now, I was embraced for any of this, and I made a lot of bad choices as a result. I felt like going to sleep for 10 or 20 years and waking up in a better time. I really wanted to check out of this world because it hurt me too much. So I fell in with these other losers. I shared my money and resources with them, and they kept me numbed up with hard drink and all sorts of other unmentionable items. These guys weren't just dealers and pimps. They were bullies and abusers and complete jerks. But for a period of time, I became head jerk. I found that pushing people around also helped numb my pain. It made me feel like I was back in charge of my life. Or like I was the one who made all the decisions. And not the random hands of this fate character who had killed the three people who mattered most to me. All in under a month. I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me, and I'm not asking you to forgive me my choices, but I do hope you can see how I got broken, and how I became bad. Now this pack of guys and I, we were werewolves. I don't have a story for you about a dramatic incident in which I got bitten by a wolf, and then I found myself transforming under the light of the next full moon. I'm telling you that I was so numbed up that I have no memories of how it all started. I just remember that after I started hanging with those guys, we would wake up naked in weird places. We initially blamed it on blackouts from too much drinking. Well, actually, that, that probably was actually part of the cause. I remember that after a while, we all accepted that this kept happening because we were werewolves. Or at least we became them at night after we got drunk enough. Like, I've read other kinds of werewolves say that they don't remember very well what happened when they were in werewolf form. So it could be that causing the blackouts. Or in our case, it could have been the cases of beer and bourbon we'd fly through each night in those old days. As we became bigger and bigger a-holes, we started bossing bartenders around and taking establishments over so that we could more easily bully and abuse whoever was unlucky enough to be in our vicinity that night. We started acting like werewolves even when we were in human form, if you know what I mean. We would go to places where the owners or staff had known my parents, 
that we would take advantage of that connection to get dinners I'd put on the tab, and we'd cause some kind of disturbance or another by acting like big shots. We all started to remember and be more aware of running as wolves in the night, and each of us started to get more and more into their monstrous side. I'm not sure how else to explain it. Maybe I should say that we had never really been nice like Dr. Jekyll, but we found ourselves going deeper and deeper into our Mr. Hyde versions anyway. We started to attract a small following of individuals, mostly girls, who must have been very masochistic to want to be anywhere near any of us. It's funny to me in a way that I now think back on the early days of running with the wolf pack as being sort of an innocent time. We became animals at night. We behaved like wolves. Now that's not all bad. It's natural in many ways and not evil. Yes, we did hunt and kill, but we ate what we took down, and we had amazing adventures together in the woods. But it led to stuff that eventually forced me to get out of the lifestyle entirely. See, in the early days when we were men, we were not nice. But when we were wolves, we roamed free and felt fully alive. And then somehow, and for some reason that I can't dredge out of my memory, we started becoming, well werewolves. I know, I know, we already were werewolves, but I mean, we started to become the other kind, the kind that are like people, the ones that stand up on their hind legs, not the more natural ones that run around on all fours and behave like canines. No, I mean, we started to become the upright dogman kind of werewolves. Like I said, I'm blurry about how things happened first, but my gut tells me that we must have been starting to turn into wolves, then got distracted one time. Maybe that's how it started. We would begin to become the wolf, but we would never get to that part about dropping down to all fours and barking. We would be starting to grow claws out of our hands, but the hands would still be useful. Our minds would not be wolfen yet. We had more conscious control when we were bipedal, and we were far more sadistic than our wolf selves would ever have wanted to be. Now, instead of being free of our anger and spite and bitter hatred of the world when we roamed at night, we were seeped in that same bitterness and violence. We just got worse and worse. We became organized criminals, really. We would shake people or store owners down for money, sometimes even when I had enough money already on me. We started to do things just because we figured we could get away with it. And then one of the sheriff's deputies became one of us werewolves. After that, it seemed like we were practically the law ourselves. We turned that community into the Wild West. And this situation persisted for years. I mean, like four or five years of people just taking whatever we dished out. I'm not sure I even understood anymore that what I was doing was wrong. When people smile and give you money, when they say thank you just because you didn't beat them up, you start to think that you're really a good guy after all. I mean, everyone always told me how great I was. The police let me get away with anything I wanted. So I must have been an awesome guy to know, right? Everybody was saying so. But then one year we invaded a church on Halloween or the night before. We were planning to extort money out of the priest in there or the pastor or whatever it was. I don't remember what denomination of church we burst into. Our original plan was to threaten to wreck the place if he didn't give us money. Then after he gave us some, we were going to wreck the place anyway just for fun. I even had the idea that we should start to become the werewolves first to scare this pastor guy. Then trash his place that way. That way, if he had any security cameras in the church, it would see werewolves, not our human faces. So, you know, we'd be innocent, see? The thing is, the pastor in this church... He wasn't scared of us. He wouldn't give us any money. And he didn't scream when we became the wolfmen in front of his eyes. This guy had a sense of calmness about him. And it didn't make sense to me. I asked him how he could be so calm when we were obviously going to wreck him and his place. He asked me if his being upset or panicking would make me stop doing what I was going to do. I had to admit that no it wouldn't. The others started to knock stuff over, but I told them to quit it. 
and we left to bother someone that would be easier to scare. It wasn't going to be any fun at all if this guy wasn't afraid. I started to wonder how something he called faith could be stronger than a werewolf threatening his life. It was a question that gnawed at me ever since that moment. I wanted to feel what that guy was feeling. I wanted to be able to have a few moments where I didn't feel so afraid. All of my violence, all of my bullying, it was to protect myself from losing anything or anyone else that mattered to me. It was so that I could brag that I was living life to the fullest, while being able to avoid feeling any of the things that still hurt so much to feel. I mean, it even hurt to see the sun come up in those days, and so I would usually start drinking before I got out of bed. I acted like I was a tough guy, so that people wouldn't see how small and powerless I really felt. I think my werewolf sprang out of that feeling of defenselessness against a horrible nightmare world that brutally murdered every good person in my life. The pastor had changed something inside of me. I realized I was more afraid of him than he was of me. I started to want to get out of that wolf pack, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized there would be pushback. I mean, I was financing a criminal operation, even though that had never been a conscious intention of mine heading into all this. These guys were making their living off of me, and I was adding a lot of perks on top of that. Going cold turkey for me was going to be painful for them. I started to wonder if I could get them some sort of job training or retraining or something. Give them something legal and ethical to earn a living doing. Well, when I started talking like that, the others got hostile toward me right away, and a leader emerged from among them. We called him Blocko because he was so big he could block out the sun for the rest of us. He was a great guy to have on your side, believe me. I was not looking forward to having any conflict with Blocko if he wasn't going to allow me to extricate myself from this group. I knew he was big enough to destroy me with his bare hands, or his bare claws, depending on which form he was in when he stomped my life out. Now, one of the local law enforcement professionals whose name I shan't mention had expressed to me an interest in running for a local office. I was considering financing his run for this office. Initially, I was going to do it so that we werewolves would have a politician in our back pocket if we ever needed such a thing. But after Blocko started making me feel like getting out, I cut a deal with this officer. We'd let him arrest Blocko for anything, any of the many illegal things Blocko did every single day that we all protected him from. This time, we would not protect him. And the cops could take him away. Or they could try. And if Blocko were removed from the picture, I felt like I could get jobs for the others. And then I could get back to my life. So the next time we were scheduled to pick up some protection money from this particular store, I told the cops beforehand, and they were stationed inside with hidden cameras and microphones, to record the entire shakedown. This time I sent Blocko in alone to do the job, since it was an old routine by then, and the store owners always had an envelope of cash ready for us. But when Blocko went into this convenience store on that evening, though, he found the clerk far more talkative than usual. The guy kept making Blocko state specifically what he was there for. What do you mean, what am I here for? I'm here for the money. Give me the money. And then the clerk played dumb again, asking Blocko to please explain clearly what money he was referring to and asking for. Blocko, enraged and not thinking clearly, shouted out the entire history of his coming to the store to collect protection money. And the cops recorded all of this. When they got what they needed, the men burst out of hiding, surrounding Blocko with so many men that they assumed he wouldn't be able to resist them dragging him away. They underestimated Blocko. Well, from outside we heard a crash first. Then came some people screaming. And then to the surprise of some, came the unhappy shouting of Blocko himself. 
He sure didn't sound as confident as usual. And a couple of people turned to me quickly and asked if we should go in there and save him. I had to suppress a laugh. They were so loyal to him. More so than even to me. And I was the one who paid them. Well, Blocko was going up the river and out of my life. And they were going to help me make that happen. I put on my sad face and told them Blocko just got nabbed by the cops. And we'd better split out of there before we got caught too. One of the cops later told me he got a bruised rib when Blocko shoved him clean across the store into the ice cream freezer display. They told me that Blocko had picked up another cop to throw him and was holding him over his head when three different cops tasered him all at once. The cop he was holding had dropped and both of them hit the floor, wriggling all over the place uncontrollably. I was surprised that it took only three tasers to take Blocko down. I didn't even think that would take me down when I was in werewolf form. But obviously it would have since I was in no way as big as Blocko the Bear Man. He and I have not been in communication since that night. Poor Blocko. Me and the cops made up some story for the others about how the police were getting pressured from the feds to crack down on our gang or something. Or maybe it was pressure from the governor, I don't even really remember. The important part was that without Blocko to lead them, the others fell for it and believed us completely. They were willing and in some cases even eager to stand down and go straight. Well, not all of them went straight, but at least they left me out of their business. And that's really all I have a right to ask for. So I don't hang with werewolves anymore. And I stopped transforming. I know this won't work for all of you. But I feel like I was only doing it because that was what my friends did. I had never been without a family before. I think my subconscious took over my life for me while I numbed my conscious mind down. I think I lived in a semi-dream state and that I just accepted that I was a werewolf. I surrounded myself with werewolves so I must have been a werewolf. These days I surround myself with things that tell me who I would like to become. Not who I was in the past or even who I am right now. I exercise, I meditate, and I eat the carnivore diet. Hey, I gotta let the werewolf inside me have something, right? So I throw him a bone. Literally. I do think that I could backslide, and I do think that I could possibly become a werewolf again. The werewolf comes out of my dreams, out of my subconscious mind. This is why I have to lead a conscious life in order to keep him at bay. When I get angry, I sense him trying to take over. One time I lost my temper and I swear, I smelled the werewolf body odor that I haven't smelled in so long. He was ready to come back out and he would have been quite happy to pick up where he left off. But I stopped him by calming my anger. Just like I'm going to have to take a deep breath and stop him over and over and over again. It's going to have to be a conscious decision each time. Now, I know that some of you out there who are suffering from this condition are not going to be able to walk away from it as easily as I did. I've been researching a bit and here are a few of the things that I've learned recently. There is a woman named Patricia Biggs who wrote a novel called Blood Moon Rising. In the book, her female werewolf character named Mercy uses St. John's wort to help control her anger. I now have that on my shopping list and plan on getting some soon. The fictional Mercy character also uses wolfsbane as an ingredient in a potion that makes her less likely to transform when the moon is full. Now, I would not advise this, since wolfsbane is poisonous, especially for werewolves. I don't know if I was actually more likely to change under the full moon anyway. My group seemed to be anger or excitement based when we became the monsters. I have also seen a couple of people say that mistletoe helps heal werewolfism, believe it or not. But if you fail to prevent your werewolf behavior, and you would like to warn your loved ones to protect themselves from you, the internet tells me that rowan berries in your pocket will protect you from werewolves that's R-O-W-A-N. What are rowan berries? I really don't have any idea.
Also, the internet says that vervain tea will protect you from werewolves. Again, what is vervain tea? I've got zero clues for you. That's V-E-R-V-A-I-N. The thing that I'm taking away from all this, though, is that it's got to be a decision you make and stick to if you want to quit being a werewolf. If you honestly want to heal your werewolfism, then I do believe that you can find something or some way that will allow you to accomplish this. I don't think it'll be easy. So you're not likely to make the change until you get really sick of doing things the werewolf way. Maybe you won't ever be ready to make the change in this lifetime. Or maybe listening to this video has made you ready to change right now. A flower can't bloom before it's time. And neither can you. So whatever path you're on, whether you're ready to give up your monster side or if you're only getting started monstering around, I wish you good luck. And I wish you a happy Halloween. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Johnson, a fan of werewolves in Wisconsin. At least I assume he's a fan of the Wisconsin werewolf because he just joined our channel membership club here on YouTube. Now Anthony Johnson gets to see our weekly secret uncensored dogman stories. Real Wolfman, True Encounters in Modern America. A lot of the stories we run on this channel are supposed to be true. But it's not like I have budget or time to look into any of the claims made. Someone who made her living looking into Dogman claims, though, was the late, great Linda Godfrey. If you like the stories on this show, then you should check out this incredible audiobook from Linda called Real Wolfmen, True Encounters in Modern America. Linda goes back to the 1930s and tells a number of the better researched Dogman and werewolf stories of the 20th and 21st centuries. It's a great overview of the subject matter. Whether you're new to it, or even if you think you know all the stories, it's available in audiobook, audio CD, paperback, or Kindle forms at the address in the description for this video. The audiobook is over 8 hours and is probably the best deal there. Plus, if you use the link in the description, supposedly you're helping us out here in some way that I'm still learning about. Hey, it's me, PQ River. And I'll be coming back to Scary Stories to read an all-new Scary Dog Man tale on October 30th. It's going to be creepy, and it should get you in the Halloween spirit, so don't miss it. Welcome to Scary Stories. They call me PQ River. If you're hearing my voice... It means that our old pal Bigfoot has caught his roommate's sore throat and can't read for you today. Don't worry. I live in New Mexico, and no flu virus can survive in the heat out here. Biggie sent me something good to read for you, so get comfortable. It's one of what he says is a pile of allegedly true stories by an anonymous contributor that describes himself as the spry old codger. The codger has stories that he says happened to him about werewolves, aliens, Bigfoot, and some kind of oversized bird. He's spent his life on a farm, but it seems the weird has his address in their book. This one I'm going to read to you today starts off seeming like it's a UFO story, and I guess it sort of is, but it's mainly a dogman story, so give it a minute in order to get started. Ready or not. Here comes the allegedly true narrative we're going to call The Spry Old Codger and the Dog Man. Dear Scary Stories NYC, Here is the scary dog man story I sent you a query letter about. It is all true as I remember it, and I remember those days a lot better than I remember things that happened ten minutes ago. Since I listened to your show with headphones on, when I'm going to sleep at night, I'd like to present it in the form of a campfire tale or bedtime story. So gather around, folks, and listen up. I reckon it's time I shared a tale from my younger days, back when I was in my late 20s and a tad more spry than I am these days. It was the early 70s, 
a time of bell bottoms and peace signs when life was simpler and the world seemed a bit more mysterious. Back then, we all wanted to know more. More about celebrities, more about how the government works, more about how the bigwigs make their decisions. These days, we mostly wish we could unsee an awful lot of stuff. Good luck to you if you plan on sticking around much longer in this century. I'm here to offer you a 10 or 20 minute vacation from the present year, if you'd like it. We can journey together to a land where things are still only starting to get stupid. It's a place where every man is allowed to have his equal say, where freedom is still considered a good thing The people write songs about, and bacon is under one dollar per pound. You heard me. This place not only has real freedom, it has cheap bacon. Where is this utopia, you ask? Well, you might not like the answer, because this magical land I'm describing is Richard Nixon's America of the early 70s. They kicked him out when they caught him spying on his political rivals. These days, they won't even kick them out if they spy on the entire country. So yeah, seriously, come with me. Back to a time before the idiocracy, when the scariest things we had to deal with or monsters and cryptids and such like. Does YouTube have any public domain 70s rock music? You should give us just like 35 or 45 seconds of it now to set the mood. That's good enough. Okay, now I'm feeling less like I'm in my 70s and more like it is the 70s. And so, now that I'm in the mood, I'm going to begin my story. Oh wait, before I get into my long, involved story, I wanted to give you a little short appetizer, you might say. This was the first time I seen a dog man, although I thought it was just a fluke sighting at the time. Yeah, I should tell you this first, because I'm not certain it doesn't have to do with the main story, which I'll hop into right afterwards. Now. It was a week before harvest, and my corn was standing tall and proud, just waiting to be plucked. The sun was just about to tuck itself in for the night, and I was out on my porch, enjoying the cool breeze. That's when I saw it, a figure moving through the cornfield. Now mind you, this wasn't no ordinary critter. This was big, and its dog head was sticking up clear as day above the corn plants. How tall is a corn stalk ready to be harvested? Well, this booger was taller than that. It was a sight to remember, brother. A dogman or wolfman or whatever you want to call it. I ain't never seen anything like it before, but I've seen a bunch since. It was running through my field, not a care in the world. Well, I wasn't about to let some creature trample my crops, so I grabbed my wife's shotgun and hollered at it. Get out of here, you varmint. I yelled, and I fired a shot into the air. That thing turned and looked at me, and I swear, it had the most human eyes I ever seen on a beast. Then it took off faster than a jackrabbit with its tail on fire. Next day, I went out to where I'd seen it. Curious as a cat, I was half expecting to find some tracks or maybe some fur, but there wasn't a trace of that creature. It was like it vanished into thin air. I checked the corn too, and I found no tracks or hair or scat there either. Now, I don't know what that creature was or where it came from, but I reckoned at the time that it was just passing through, maybe looking for a place to rest its weary paws. So that was autumn, or the end of summer at least. Fast forward to early in spring the next year, just a few days before planting season was about to begin. Ready? Here's where the spry old codger story really starts. Once upon a time I lived in the greatest country in the history of the world. I woke up each day knowing that things were great and only gonna get better. One fine morning, as the first rays of dawn peeked over the horizon, I was out tending to my farm. I did have hired help, but this was the end of a time off for them until planting season was about to start up in a few days. This was an in-between time on the farm where nobody was there except for me, the wife, and the two young ones. The air was crisp, the birds were just starting to sing their sweet melodies, and the darkness was starting to slowly light up. 
Everything felt ordinary, which was a good thing back in those days, but little did I know. Something extraordinary was about to unfold, something I'd still be talking about when I was an old man. As I gazed up at the purple and blue early morning sky, my eyes caught sight of something peculiar. There, above the dense woods near my farm, was a craft like nothing I'd ever seen before. It was shaped like a cigar, glowing with an otherworldly light. It was a UFO like I'd read about in the Inquirer. My heart skipped a beat, and I couldn't tear my eyes away from that thing up there. I thought it might be a blimp that was all lit up, but it didn't have any blinking lights on it. For you younger listeners, that means that if it was an earthly craft, it was an illegal one. So whether piloted by man or alien, I knew it shouldn't be there in that airspace, and that put me on guard. Before I knew it, a really weird sensation washed over me. I couldn't move a muscle as if time itself had frozen. The craft, it seemed, was drawn closer and larger with each passing moment, though I knew it was only me that was locked in place. My mind raced trying to make sense of what was happening. Now, I ain't one to easily scare, but I'll admit, fear started creeping in. Thoughts of unknown and spooky things from the twilight zone filled my head, but deep down, I knew I had to stay calm and face whatever was coming my way. Just as the craft loomed overhead, a gust of wind swept through the trees, rustling the leaves and sending shivers down my spine. The breeze grew stronger, and the craft seemed to pulsate with an energy I couldn't comprehend. It was a sight that would stay with me for the rest of my days. Out of that craft, like a pack of wild animals, ran at least six tall, bear-sized, fast-moving creatures. They had two legs, muscles bulging like they could lift a whole barn, and faces covered in hair. Dog faces what they were, and hairy from head to toe. These creatures, they scattered in every direction like a bunch of scared rabbits, and wouldn't you know it, one of them was headed straight for me. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I could feel the sweat trickling down my brow. Well, I reckon I was scared out of my wits when that dog man started chasing after me. I let out a holler for my wife as I sprinted back toward the house, my heart pounding in my chest. I grabbed anything I could find and threw it in the creature's path, hoping to slow it down. But that dog man was fast, I tell ya. I spotted a yellow plastic toy baseball bat lying on the ground and snatched it up, swinging it at the creature as hard as I could. It let out a growl, but it didn't back down. I kept swinging and swinging, trying to fend it off, but it kept on coming at me. Just when I thought I was done for, my wife burst out of the back door rifle in hand. She aimed it straight at the dog man's head, her eyes filled with determination. The creature froze in its tracks, staring down the barrel of that rifle. Time froze as we had ourselves a bit of a standoff. Well, let me tell you, that dog man was a sight to behold standing there in the sunlight. How many people get a chance to see such a thing so close and with the sun coming up? Not many, right? And how many lived to tell the tale? Far fewer, believe me. The beast man had ears like a wolf, pointy and alert, twitching with every sound, and them fangs, oh boy, they were something else. Long and sharp sticking out from its mouth like prehistoric daggers. It's a wonder how they fit in there at all. Now it's co- well, it was a mess, flea-bitten and shaggy, like it hadn't seen a good grooming in ages, and its body, let me tell you, it was something to reckon with. Muscles bulging and rippling under that matted fur like it could tear a tree right out of the ground. Them legs, they were dog-like, sturdy and powerful, and the height of that creature, well, it towered over me. I reckon it must have been at least seven feet tall, if not more. And the way it moved with such speed and agility was like watching a wild animal on the hunt. In that dawn light, every detail of that dog man was etched into my memory. As I locked eyes with the beast, I couldn't help but notice the range of emotions playing out on its face. At first there was a sense of curiosity, like it was trying to figure me out. But as moments ticked by, I could see the nervousness creeping in. It was as if the beast was realizing that humankind was its match, that we weren't going to back down without a fight. Now, 
I know some folks might think it's arrogant to take such a human-centric position, but let me tell you. I've seen enough in my years to know that we humans are capable of some mighty impressive things. We built cities, tame the land, and even reach for the stars, so it ain't too far-fetched to think that a creature like the Dogman might just be getting a taste of its own medicine by staring into the eyes of a superior creature, namely me. Just like Captain Kirk used to say, we humans have a way of rising to the occasion, of facing the unknown with courage and determination. And that's exactly what I saw in that beast's eyes, like when he was looking at me, he was seeing old James Tiberius from the TV. The dog man was growing increasingly nervous because it knew, deep down, that it had met its match. Well, I'll be darned if that creepy old cryptid didn't turn tail and run on two legs. As it sprinted away, I couldn't help but notice the fur on its back. It had these markings that looked more like a cat's fur than a wolf's or dog's. It was all sleek and shiny, with stripes and spots that seemed to shimmer in the sunlight. I ain't never seen anything like it before or since. Well, I grabbed that rifle right out of my wife's hands and started shouting at that dog man as it turned tail and run. I shouted at the top of my lungs, you better run, you alien varmint. This here forest belongs to us humans and we won't stand for your invasive species polluting our land. I waved my rifle in the air, feeling a surge of pride in my voice as I reminded the dogman how these outer space entities had no right to defile the freedom of our great country. America's always been a land of liberty, and it's high time we took back control of our forests from these intergalactic intruders. As a farmer who spent countless hours tending to my land and observing the natural world around me, I've come to a fascinating realization. There's something peculiar happening in our midst, something that goes beyond the realm of conventional understanding. I believe that aliens may be responsible for the presence of invasive species, such as the enigmatic dogman, or even other cryptids like Sasquatch, Yeti, Ogopogo, Nessie, and possibly the Hodag. I mean, there's an alien connection to shadow people, at least some of them. Well, I mean, I've heard that. I'm happy to say I've not seen any shadow people because those creep me out. As for my wife, she only saw the one dog man that night and she never saw the glowing craft. It must have flown away or made itself invisible or something while I had my back turned it, because after I ran back toward the farmhouse, I didn't see or hear the spaceship any longer. My wife believes my story because she saw that wolf man that chased me back to the house, and she knows this is not the kind of thing I would lie about. I ain't saying I never lied to the woman, but the times I had, it was to avoid drama and conflict. I would never lie to make up a fable, unless the lie was less painful than the truth, and in no way was that big toothy monster man less painful than anything. That fellow was pretty much pain personified, if you ask me which I know you didn't, but you should have. And if you had, that's what I would have told you. But the dog man is pain personified, so you don't want to mess with him if you can possibly avoid it. And he wouldn't even be on our planet if it weren't for whoever's piloting those flying saucer drone craft that dropped these things off. But the obvious question is, why do aliens like to introduce alien species? From rains of fish or frogs to the drop-off of Michigan dogmen in my field, it's clear that these entities are deliberately altering our environment. But why? I think that's a good question. Why? What are their potential motives? While we can honestly only guess about their intentions, several theories have been put forth that I think are worth considering. One possible motive is experimentation. It is conceivable that aliens with their advanced technology and scientific knowledge may be conducting experiments on Earth's ecosystems. By introducing invasive species, they could be observing what happens to native plants and wildlife, studying the sturdiness and adaptability of different species, or even testing the limits of Earth's life forms. Another motive could be colonization. If aliens have plans to establish a presence on Earth, introduce an invasive species could serve as a way to prepare the environment for their own survival.
By altering the ecosystem, they may be creating conditions that are more favorable to their own species, ensuring their successful colonization. I don't like the implications of this theory, and it kind of makes me wonder if some of our leaders are from outer space. Aliens may have a vested interest in messing up Earth systems for reasons unknown to us. This could be a deliberate attempt to weaken our planet's natural defenses, making it more susceptible to future invasion or exploitation. The potential consequences seem pretty major to me. I mean, if they're doing what I think they're doing, it could have a devastating effect on earthling ecosystems, leading to the decline or extinction of our animals and plants to be replaced by... what exactly? This loss of biodiversity can disrupt the delicate balance of human and earthling life, affecting the overall health and functioning of our entire planet. So, you know, while we can only speculate on the motives behind aliens introducing invasive species, theories such as experimentation and disruption of ecosystems provide intriguing possibilities. Both would logically be being done to soften us for takeover. Understanding these motives and their potential consequences seems crucial in our efforts to protect Mother Earth and preserve the delicate harmony of our natural world. I mean, we're going to make any effort in that direction. So, we've never gone public about that story because any time we tell it to friends or family, we get mocked, called all sorts of names. Everybody seems to think that we're simpletons, and they all say if they were there when it happened, they could have explained to us that we were only seeing the full moon or we were seeing a bear were too stupid to know that it wasn't a dog man. Well... I don't care if some people call it a trick of the light or a figment of our imagination. In my heart, I know it was something more. It was a glimpse into a world beyond our own, reminding me and the missus that there's still so much we don't understand. So, my friends, as you drift off to sleep tonight, remember this tale of mine and know that even in the quietest corners of our world, there are mysteries waiting to be unraveled. This is Spry Old Codger signing off for now. Sleep tight, and may your dreams be filled with wonder and adventure. Hey, I just want to say I've been reading this fascinating book about the dogmen and werewolves, written by the late Linda Godfrey. It's a real classic on the subject. I've noticed that there are some sharp discrepancies between her version of a certain famous classic dogman appearance in the 20th century and the History Channel's version of the same event. I'm working on a semi-animated episode using maps and imagery to illustrate visually the two different versions as they're explained, try to get closer to the truth than possibly anyone has ever gotten before. You know you can get the audiobook version of this important book for only $6 if you follow the link in the description, and you help out our channel if you do. And now for something completely hairy. And now, I'd like to end by thanking our channel members and PayPal Club members. First of all, we have to thank Godzilla Tim, who I'll be thanking more formally in our Saturday night show this week. This man has joined twice to our channel membership, and he gave us five pounds British just last night on top of that. So yeah, we will be thanking Godzilla Tim again tomorrow. We also want to thank Kathy Barrickman, of course, as we always do. That having been said, we love all of our channel members and we are only still online because of the support of each and every one of you guys. I'm going to read out these randomly as they come up. All of these people are just as important to the channel as the others, and we love you all equally. In random order, thank you to Efren Kalunga, Mary Shabazz, Fraggy Dendron aka Magara, James Fleming, Nancy Sears, Matthew Frederick, Ace Williams, who's also joined twice like Godzilla Tim, Innocencio de Divas, Anna White, Deborah Darcy, Julie Sadler, Ron Barracuda, who has been joined to our channel membership the longest.
Blue Cruz, Super Spark, Victor O, Helena 66, Esteban P, Angie K, Roy Faulkner, Stel Cordova, Michelle Rich, Adam Friday, Hagridella, Jim Mooney, Deborah Ariola, Scott Fuller, Chris Nyes, Stacy Miller, Tiffany Walsh, Melissa Kutch, John Smith, Dave Rabbit, Victor Collado, Fuzzy Lou, The Ender Werewolf, The Zoomancer, Michael A. Bell, Linda Hagler, Sarah Jones, James Tucker, Nicholas Carroll, Todd Graves, Mr. Spinks, Patricia Taggart, Franco Albi. What was that with three question marks? Valerie Gomez, a.k.a. Nicole Gomez. Long Island Bigfoot, who just signed up for seven months of memberships. Scott Halisic. Johnny Pasillas. Justin Simon. Anthony Johnson. And a special thank you and message for Jeff Kennedy. We keep getting PayPal payments from you, but your email no longer exists. So we have no way to send you the links to our members-only shows. I hope you're okay. If you're still with us and you hear this message, please connect a different email to your PayPal. Or else please contact me with a different way I can send you the links. Hope all is well with you and with everyone still listening this late into the show. Please let me know if you'd like me to continue this podcast and try to make it a series. Or if you think it's just a Halloween thing that we should drop in November. Please come back tomorrow on YouTube and Rumble when we will have a new story about a friendly dogman. Hope to see you then and happy Halloween.